for there. All right, so today we're going to talk about argument. Um, we're going to get right into it um, so I can get through it um, and, and get things uh, organized the way they, they need to be organized. Um, um, and then uh, once we get through this, then uh, I'm going to take a break. Um, I'll, I'll take about a 15 minute break and then uh, we'll come back and um, we can have our our regular conversations about what's going on in the world and that kind of stuff. Um, but I got to get this done first so I can work on that uh, video and whatnot um, this afternoon. So, all right. So here's what we're working with. We're working with argument, right? So we're going to work through, through some questions, um, some things that uh, that I move. By the way, I move my whole office around, so now my screens are over here instead of way up here. So you'll see me look in different directions now. Um, I moved everything around. So um, so this is what we're going to be working with right here. Um, we're going to be working with what is argument. I'm going to blow this up a little bit so it's a little easier to see on the screen. Um, we're going to be working with what is argument, what is academic argument, what's the problem with people or the, the old adage of people are entitled to their own opinions. Um, and then we're going to look at uh, classical argument, Rogerian argument, Tolmanian argument, and then rhetoric, exigency, and then what are the tenets of strong arguments. So, so that's going to be that's what we're going to be working with. Um, so if you got any questions along the way, please uh, jump in and uh, and and just uh, you know uh, throw them at me because um, it's just going to be helpful for the people who watch the video later. Um, okay, so first of all, what is argument? Right, we use the term argument. It's a misnomer. Um, argument uh, is not you're a sack of motherfuckers and that kind of stuff. That's not argument. That that's fighting. Right. Um, that's trying to that that's a, a battle between people trying to get their way. Argument, um, by definition, is uh, the act um, of asserting, supporting, and defending a claim. Okay? That's what it is. Okay? Okay? Um, it's an intellectual, oops, not an intellectual. An intellectual and social process. Um, if it's a social process, right, uh, let me do this real quick. I'm going to put a hanging indent on this. If it's a social process, um, there are some examples that we can look at um, that are social arguments, right? So social arguments are um, good lord, I can't type today. Social arguments are uh, advert advertisements or advertisements, depending upon where you are in the world and which brand of English you speak. Uh, songs, posters, stories, movies, television series, um, books, books, even though most most people don't read them anymore, books are always are, are a social argument as well. Uh, okay, so those are those are some examples um, of social arguments. Um, right. Uh, notice what's n what's not on there is social media. Right. Social media is it's not a social argument. It's uh, it's akin to I'm right dot com. That's really what that is. It's people just the more you like shit, the more shit you see that's like that shit you liked. Um, so it's it's confirmation bias is what it is. And that's uh, I posted something about that yesterday on on my Instagram about the internet being the ultimate and confirmation bias, and that we when we like things, we just end up seeing more things that we like um, because 
I, I, I say this a lot. Um, anything that's pleasing to the eye is considered pornography. So when I talk about pornography, I'm not talking about sex. I'm not talking about porn videos and that kind of stuff. What I talk about when I talk about pornography is anything that's pleasing to the eye, anything that's captivating is considered pornography. That is a strict definition of it, right? So food can be pornography to some people. For me, it's motorcycles and cars. I fucking love them, right? Uh, motorcycles to me are art that can kill you, and I love them. Some people it's guns, some people it's wood, like wood furniture, right? All of those things that are pleasing are pornographic, right? Um, because they, they elicit that same kind of response to us. They, 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 uh, activate the pleasure, excuse me, the pleasure centers of the brain. So people, social media becomes pornographic because the more you like things, the more things like that you see and therefore we keep scrolling because it's pleasing to us. It, it activates our, our pleasure centers. So social media is not a social argument. It is, uh, it's, it's a social enterprise. Um, people are making shit tons of money on it. Um, and the more they can keep you engaged, the more money they make. But it's really not, uh, it's not a, a social argument at all, okay? So, what's the difference between a, a regular argument and an academic argument? Well, an academic argument, um, these are designed to make others others let me learn how to type again others see the wisdom of a position or perspective and take action whatever that action is right doesn't matter what it is if you want people to to read a book right you give them a a, a compelling reason to do it. You're making an academic argument. If you're, um, if, if you want someone to to go see a film, or if you want someone to begin exercising, or maybe stop eating food that's bad for them, you have to make an academic argument. Those are that you have to look at them and and let people see the wisdom behind it, and not just I want you to do this. You have to give them facts and and things like that. Without facts, without the 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 backing of, of information, it just becomes your opinion. Um, so, you know, um, my people tell me all the time that, you know, I should eat more green leafy vegetables for the, because they're good for me. Okay, but they taste, they taste bad. I don't like them, so I don't eat them, right? Um, I'll take a multivitamin instead. And people are like, well, that's not a good substitute. Then why did they make the substitute? And they can't answer the question. <laughs> so, all right. So, is the multivitamin as good as eating those things? No, but it is a viable substitute, right? So, so it's the thing you want people to do. You want them to take up, take an action, right? That kind of stuff. Um, you want them to to see the wisdom in whatever it is, right? Um, the 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 process of making an academic argument, right? Um, it begins, um, it means I like to <laughs> put some cheese on your broccoli. No, no, exactly. Uh, what Library Wizard said, right? What Amy said, that, that means you like cheese. I've, I've tried broccoli every, uh, I've tried broccoli every way you can fix it, and I hate it. If you put cheese on it, it just fucks up cheese. Okay, I like cheese. It, it's just broccoli's, I can't stand the smell of it when it cooks. Um, so, uh, rentals from the bookstore. Um, textbook rentals are extended as far as I know. I have, I thought I had an email about that. Uh, let me make sure, let me answer that definitively. Um, I think I have it. So. Yeah, it's, it, there, I, I'm pretty sure there was a. I don't know who it came from. That's the problem. Um, I don't know who it came from. But 
which I think there's an email about it. We should, those things should be extended. Um, so they added the 15 grace period. Okay, so you have until May 26. Okay, thank you, Amy. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I have. I, I have it somewhere. Um, it's just probably not accessible via my phone because it only loads so many emails at a time. All right. So we have two. We have these two things, right? We have argument, right, and then we have academic argument. So what's the problem with the with the old adage of people are entitled to their own opinions? All right. Here's the problem. The main problem is this, that we, we have entered into a place in our society where people's opinions are often viewed the same as facts, and they're not equal. They're not. Um, the fact that my opinion that, that, I, that broccoli smells like feet is irrelevant when taken into consideration the facts that broccoli has a nutritional value and it's and and it has a, a a benefit to the to the human body those two things are not equal okay they're they're simply not so when someone says well i think the president has done a good job as 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 president there are no facts to support that opinion they don't exist so you can have that opinion, but you have no support for it, and therefore an opinion is just something the way we we is something the way we, we we see the world, right? The deal with this, the problem with these adages is is this, right? They are set in stone. Okay, people's opinions are their opinions, and you're not going to change their opinion, right? So the I, I don't argue with people about about our our current president. I don't argue with them about them anymore. I, if somebody has something to say about it, I just go huh and walk away, because that person right is not going to hear anything I say. They're, they're they're immune to facts. That's how I put it. They're immune to facts, right? Because they don't care, right? So I just don't worry about it, right? Um, they are oversimplified. Okay. Opinions are oversimplified, okay? That's why they're indefensible, it's because they're oversimplified, okay? Opinions are also dismissive. Oops. Right? The phrase, people are entitled to their own opinion, is dismissive in its nature. Um, it basically says it doesn't matter what you say, they're entitled to think whatever they want. Okay, and they are, and I am entitled not to engage with that person. I'm entitled not to talk to that person. I'm entitled not to value anything that that person has to say. Pretty easy, right? I can just walk away, okay? Um, it's not that big a deal, right? The phrase itself ignores progress, okay? It looks at you're entitled to your own opinion. Doesn't matter what we now know. Doesn't matter that progress has taught us some new things, right? Um, it's like if you're if you've ever talked to your grandparents and they have some racist point of views, people say, "Well, they're entitled to their own opinion." Are they? No, it ignores progress, right? It simply says that I can freeze myself right here in 1956. And I don't have to see the world any other way, right? That's what my grandmother did, and that's why I'm glad she's gone. That's why I'm glad she died. Um, I was happy when that woman died because the world is better off without people like her in it. Um, and that may sound cold, and it may sound cruel to people, but that's the truth of it. The world is better off without racists in it. And my grandmother was an absolute racist, right? Um, we, didn't, we didn't need her anymore. We didn't need her to begin with, but we had a lot of them, a lot of people like her. Um, and so when she died, I was like, hmm, good. I took my mother to her funeral like a good son would do, right? But I was really there just to make sure she was dead. And while that preacher was sitting up there going, you know, Alice is sitting at the right hand of God, I was like, motherfucker, you didn't know this woman. Mm -mm. If she gets into heaven, fuck, I'm safe. There's nothing I can do, right, that's ever going to keep me out. 
right? So that's why the phrase everybody's entitled to their own opinions doesn't work out a lot, right? That's why it's, it ignores progress. Um, because it's it's a matter of your, your, you can have your opinions, right? But your opinion should shift when new facts are presented, when new information is, is gained, right? Um, and it basically says... What other people think, oops, it doesn't matter to me. It is a closed minded position. So when people say, well, you know, you're, you're entitled to your own opinion. No, I, I, I have facts. I, it's, you know, so you have unsubstantiated opinions and then you have substantiated opinions right um, substantiated opinions are um, are ones that we can we can back things up with facts we can look up things and we can say no here's what happened and here's when it happened and here's why it happened um, other people are just like well you know, that's just your opinion right it's the same thing with the word theory people that's just a theory well a theory means it has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt and we hold it to be scientifically accurate and two new evidence is gained that disproves the theory right gravity gravity is a theory you think a theory is not proven and tested go walk off a building and see how that works for you right uh, when they really mean hypothesis, right? Hypothesis is an untested idea, right? Uh, but people are lazy and they don't want to learn things like that. So, as Dunny said, I always ask when people say, "Nearly his right hand, do you want which hand they wait with?" Yeah, I, it's it's just it's a it's a silly statement, right? So that's the issue with um, with people. When they don't, when they want to talk about our argument, they want to talk about, what they really want to talk about is fighting, right? Um, I don't, I, I don't fight with people. I will have an, a, a debate with you. I'll have an argument with you in this sense, but I will not fight with anybody, um, especially not over the internet. Not going to happen, right? Not going to happen. So, um, just a waste of time. So, if somebody comes to my Instagram page and they, blah, 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 they're bullshit. I just immediately block them because I don't care. I really don't. I, it, if you don't like what I say, don't come back to my page. But don't report me and don't do you know don't do shit like that because that's just chicken shit. You know. Um, so just do what I do. I read some shit that I don't agree with. I scroll right on past it. Right. I don't have to engage with everything. I don't. So. So. Um, all right, so we're going to look at classical argument, right? Classical argument is 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 kind of what everybody goes back to within academia. They want you to engage with classical argument. Well, we can't really do that um, because classical argument um, it, it it kind of it was founded. Um, let me see, this is going to. I don't want to bold it. It was founded in ancient Greece. And Rome, and so they kind of they kind of built the uh, the foundations of classical argument, right? Um, there's a couple of uh, of different uh, classes for it. There's Aristotelian argument. Good Lord, learn how to spell, dummy. Aristotelian argument. So. Aristotelian argument works from this idea of fact. Uh, where's the thing I'm looking for? Oh, there it is. Moves to a claim. From that claim, right? Oops, 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 oops. oops. Let me back up. So, value then determines worth. Then we have a policy, and we move into what can be done. So this is the way Aristotelian argument works, right? Um, we have a fact that moves to a claim, right? 
Uh, we have value that, that then moves into tell me what it's worth, right? If this is what our value is, right, then what is, what is that thing worth so, society, within society, right? Um, you know, if you, uh, if you don't have a cup and I have a cup, right, um, or I maybe, uh, let's say I have two cups and you have zero, right, how much is that cup worth to you, right? So this is where we begin to have the argument about worth and value, right? Um, policies then become what can we do? What can be done? What are we allowed to do? Um, and so Aristotelian argument begins to move through these things, right? Um, it works off of what are called proofs. So we have the three proofs are evidence, examples, and appeals, okay? Oops. Good Lord. You'd think I'd learn how to do that. These support what our claims are. Okay? So, within composition, what we look at is this is this is kind of how we build um, uh, classic essays and arguments within academia. This is how we teach you to do it in the beginning, and then we teach you more co complex ways to do it, right? So we have a claim, then we find examples or uh, uh, evidence for that claim, and then what are the appeals to it? Right, appeals to authority. This is not appeals like, hey, we're going to change something. This is a this is appeal to. Um, let me uh, let's do this. So there, we're going to. These are appeals to ethos, oops, logos, and pathos. Right, that's what we're talking about. Appeals, appeals to ethics, appeals to logic, appeals to uh, to emotions. Okay, not menthos. No, no. No, those don't work. All right. Um, so those are our appeals, right? Um, so that's what we've got to look at, right? Um, so classical argument is viewed as an art form. And this is where it becomes a problem within academia. It's viewed as an art form because they look at it as a delicate process of connecting a topic to people's beliefs, good Lord, and emotions. And that's the classical viewpoint, right? Um, that's the classical viewpoint. Now, in modern academia, right, we work from this beginning piece of, uh, of Aristotelian logic and an Aristotelian argument where we say we want you to build an argument based off a claim, right? Then go and find evidence and examples, support for it, make an appeal, right? Um, that's the, the, so those of you in my 102 class, that, mid, that midterm essay, the mistress essay, is a classic Aristotelian argument, right? I want you guys to make an appeal. I want you can you can persuade people, you can inform people, you can argue, you can you can uh, do whatever you want to do. You make an appeal to one of those things. Now, the research project, the the longer paper of the two, is based upon an appeal to logic. Period. Right? There's no emotion. There's none of that. It has to be based upon facts. It has to be based off defensible claims that you have evidence for. And your conclusion has to be driven by the evidence you've presented. You don't get to just make up some shit and go, blah, blah, right? Um, you have to, it has to, the, so the facts have to support the conclusion. You're making a case for something. You're, you're, you're trying to defend a position, right? That's the difference between the two assignments, right? So it's viewed as an art form, and this is where it becomes the problem, right? Is people think that writing is an art form when there's actually more science to it than they than people think there is, right? Um, but classical argument is an art form, right? You're, you're, you're basically making an appeal. You're trying to persuade someone to do the thing that you wanted to do or think the thing you wanted to think or say the things that you wanted to say, right, by appealing to their emotions, their logic, right? Whatever, whatever you think is going to work. Um, 
And so you've got to you you've got to make through that you've got to work through that process, right? Um, all right. So that's classical argument. Argument. We come to Rogerian argument, right? Um, Rogerian argument um, was founded by Carl Rogers, okay, who was a behavioralist. I think that's right. There we go. Um, in the 20th century. Okay. Rogerian argument works from a couple of different principles. Okay. Um, it works from the idea of listening. with understanding first. Oops. Then accurately restating the other person's the person's position. For responding, some people call this parroting, right? Um, but it's a it's a matter of saying, okay, so what I hear you saying is X, Y, and Z, right? So when you when you look at Rogerian argument, you want to you want to summarize the point you're about to refute. So you want to say, um, you know, uh, supporters of this. Uh, is, let's say if you're talking about uh, uh, a bill that's in Congress or whatever, you would say supporters of this bill, right, make these arguments, right? And you would list those out, and then you would say, but here's why, right, these things don't work, right? And then you would refute that. It's called a turnabout paragraph, and it's that's how you work with Rogerian argument, is you state, restate the position of the, the, the opposing point of view, and then you give reasons why it doesn't work. You don't throw it out, baby in the bathwater, all at one time. You piecemeal it. You break it down. You say, I agree with this, however, I don't agree with this, and here's why, right? Um, and so it allows for a much more nuanced conversation than classic argument will allow us to do. So it, it's able to do that, right? And it creates common ground with the reader because you're creating, and that's the that's the key that the the key to Rogerian argument is you have to create common ground with the audience, okay? That means you have to present something that is a shared understanding. So the only way to do that is if you say House Bill 291 has problems because of blah, 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 blah. What if I don't know what House Bill 291 says? You lose me as an audience, right? So you begin by stating this is what House Bill 291, blah, 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 blah what it says, right? And then you begin to outline where the holes are in that pro in that process. That way, you're creating a common understanding, a common ground with the audience to work through your argument, right? Without that, we're just kind of left with presumptions, right? Um, and presumptive writers um, have very small audiences um, because they're writing to people who only know their writing or only know what they're talking about because they followed them we have to be much more open than that, right? We have to be much more open to, to explaining things um, and outlining things so that people are on, on the same page that we're on when we begin. Um, so in essence, if you're working with Rogerian argument, you're working from a position of being a teacher. You want a common ground, you want a common conversation to happen, and then you want to have that, that kind of rebuttal and here's why it doesn't work, here's what does work, right? And, and work from that. Okay. This removes emotion from the argument. It's going to tell me to change this to must. There we go. We'll just change it to must. So this removes argument from, or removes emotion from the argument. This is absolutely imperative, right? When you're working with with academic argument, you have to be unemotional. You have to be det detached from the emotionality of it. If anybody's ever said to you, you're too emotional when you talk about this later, that usually pisses you off, right? Um, but there's a reason they're doing it, right? And it's because 
with that emotion in front of you, you can't see the logic. You can't see the, the way it has to go. That's why um, you should never write emails when you're mad or text messages or that kind of stuff. You should kind of walk away and, and kind of let it cool off for a bit, right? Um, go for a walk or whatever. I just, you know, not a good plan, but, you know, when my former spouses or significant others and I would get into fights, I would go for a drive or I would get on my bike and take a ride, right? Because it clears my head and it gives me time to cool off and think, right? And it removes me from the situation, right? Um, and allows me, allows my, my logic to begin to kick in and start making, uh, making the points that I need to make. Um, I'm not saying get behind the wheel of a car when you're mad is a good plan. Not what I'm saying at all. That was probably not a good plan. Um, but it was my way of escaping that. Um, so, um, so that's the deal with, with Rogerian argument, right? Um, Carl Rogers, um, he also had a thing that was called, uh, the universality of the specific. Oops. Okay. What this means is the more specific we are, the more people can relate to our content, our positions, or our, oops, our arguments. Okay? This runs counter to to what most people think. Um, most people think that if I speak in generalities that I'm reaching more people. Um, um, but in reality, we need to be much more specific, right? Um, think about the, the, the writers that you like the most. You think about the television personalities or think about the, the people you, you, you watch on Twitch or what have you. Um, think about the, 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 the artists that are out there in the world, right? The reason that you gravitate to them is because they are specific. They are very, they, and their experience speaks to your experience. If they're speaking in generalities um, uh, of just general uh, experiences, uh, you know, like if I say, man, lunchtime at school was a motherfucker, wasn't it? Right? What, what have I said that's, that, that's there other than lunchtime, school, right? Those two things we can identify with. But if I start talking about square pizza, right? Right? If I start talking about things that, right? that are like square pizza, um, little milk cartons, right? Um, that you, you know, you go to open the milk carton and it says peel it and then squeeze and the motherfucker doesn't work. So you go to the other side and it's definitely not supposed to work because it's got too much glue on it. Now I'm being very specific and more people can relate to that, right? And so that's what we have to do as writers is we have to be much more specific about the things we're writing about, about the things we're talking about so that people can either identify themselves or they can identify someone they know within the content that you're providing them, right? Um, that's why I, I do story time, right? When I do story time with Puck and I tell stories, right? People like that and people gravitate to it because it's it's a very specific event. It's a very specific experience. And, um, and people are like, Jesus Christ, man, I know that person, I know a guy like that or what have you. Or they've, sent, they've, they've experienced something similar to it and it, it kind of creates common ground. That's the idea behind Carl Rogers, is he said the very things that we don't want people to know about us, the things we think make us individuals, are the things that make us all human, right? So we all have those dark moments, we have those dark thoughts, right, in our head, and those things make us all human, right? Um, and some of us let them out, right? And some of us don't, right? Um, and I had a friend of mine when I was in graduate school, um, She's one a, a very dear friend of mine, um, and she used to get mad at me when we were in graduate school. She'd get so mad at me in class, and then after class, she would come to me and she'd say, "You can't say those things," and I'd say, I, I, "Apparently, I can because I just did." And she goes, "But you can't, you can't say those things in polite society." And and after we became friends, she said, "The re she goes, I was always so mad at you because you were saying the things that I I was thinking." But I was always raised not to say, right? 
And so she would get mad because I was doing the thing that she wanted to do, but she just, her, her propriety, for lack of a better term, her propriety would get in the way of her being able to express herself effectively, right? And now she's much more like me. She's much more vocal about things. Um, and, and, you know, because she's kind of let go of some of that. But that, that's the thing, right? Is when I make dark jokes about something, people laugh and it makes them uncomfortable, but they're thinking the same things, right? Um, they just can't, uh, they, for whatever reason, they don't say it out loud, right? Um, so that's what Rogerian argument's all about. Carl Rogers um, said that those are the things that make us all the same, right? Um, all right. So, Tolman, Ar Tolman argument um, founded by Stephen Tolman. And he's a philosopher. Um, it basically claims that all arguments share characteristics. Okay. They have claims. Oops. I fucking learned how to type. I'm telling you, I can't type today. They have claims. They have grounds. I mean, they have a, a, a backing or support, right? Um, they have what is called a warrant or a reason for them to exist. Um, they have backing. They have an aspect of rebuttal that they can they can be argued or rebutted. And they have qualifiers. So qualifiers are terms by which the claim is true. So he uses them a bit differently than, than what uh, compositionists uh, define qualifiers as. Qualifiers are, they, they, they basically provide the limits of our, of, uh, of our, uh, our, our argument, which is kind of the same thing that he's saying, um, but it's, it's a little clearer for me when, when, uh, when we use the, the compositionist uh, um, definition that qualifiers uh, um, provide the limits of our uh, of our our argument where so we say this is true right when these things happen um, so he begins to, to use the same thing right um, so when you look at claims um, there are three types of claims my computer's telling me I have class in a few minutes um, I have claim good lord we have claims of fact, we have claims of policy, and we have claims of value. Okay, those are the things that we have, right? Um, Browns, these are just going to be why we're going to look at why these things exist. Our warrant is mostly how. How do these conditions come about? Backing is going to be our support. Rebuttal goes back to um, that restatement, right? Um, this is the uh, rebuttal becomes um, become opposite opinions, right? So we begin to work through these things, right? So there's three different types of argument, right? Um, these are the throw, three most widely used um, type of argument. It depends on what you're using, what you're doing. Um, uh, now, it, it, so grounds, as far as as far as Tolman goes, grounds would be assumptions. They would be things that we like, like things that we hold to be true. Um, and so that, that's what that would be. As, um, as far as qualifiers go, what you're going to look at is you're going to say the, that these things are true given these certain parameters. Like, is water always wet? Right? There's an argument that can be made there, right? That water's not always wet. Okay? Um, so one of the assumptions is that water's always a liquid, right? 
and we say that water is a liquid, right? But does it cease to become a, a water when we change it when when we when we freeze it and turn it to ice and make it a solid? The answer is no, right? The chemical composition has not changed, so there's an assumption there, right? Um, and then, so how do we make water not wet? We freeze it, right? What's the support we have for it? Well, we can build an experiment for that, right? So we can build an experiment that says water's not always wet. We can freeze it. Um, it becomes a solid, right? Um, the opposite opinions is, uh, I don't, I'm not sure there is a rebuttal for that. Um, but um, without a rebuttal, right, we have, we have, an, uh, we have a, a, an argument that is uh, not really an argument, right? It's, it becomes uh, oversimplified, right? So I'm using a very simple example to show you that the qualifiers are the things that we say, okay, here are the terms by which this thing becomes true. Water is wet when it is above, you know, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Um, but below 212 degrees Fahrenheit, right? So there's your qualifiers. It's the things, the parameters by which it makes it, it makes it true. Um, so it's it's the that's the way it is with with every uh, argument, right? Um, so according, according, so another example. So according to physicists, like this wall behind me, right, has more open space in it than actual solid space. Okay, there's more space between the atoms between the wall, right, than there are closed space. According to the laws of physics, right, I as a human being should be able to walk through that wall because there's more open space than filled space within a wall. We know that's not true, right? Um, so within certain parameters, physics is correct, right? If you get to the atomic level, physics is absolutely correct. Once you get to the to the to this the kind of the the, the macro level of, of mass, right? It becomes untrue. Okay. Um, so there's a couple of different ways to 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 kind of look at that. Okay. Um, all right. So we're going to move on to rhetoric, right? Depends on speed. <laughs> no, we should be able to, according to physics, right? According to strict physical rules, right? Pesto, we should actually be able to walk through the wall and not hit anything. We should be able to just pass right through it. That, but we can't. We know we can't. So, because there is more space between the atoms of that wall than there are between the atoms of my body, so I should be able to pass right through it but we can't. So, all right. So we're going to move on to rhetoric, right? Rhetoric is an old term. Um, it's been around for a very long time. And composition and rhetoric used to be the same group of people, right? We used to be, we used to be comp and rhetoric people. So in, that, in the 1950s, right around 1955, we all had a great big argument about which was more important, the spoken word or the written word. And we had a bunch of arguments and they split. And so now when you go to college, you have to take composition classes and you have to take oral communication classes, but they all used to be the same discipline. So we would actually have students write papers and then they would present those papers to the student body and to the faculty at the end of the semester, right? Um, and that's, that's what comp and rhetoric was all about. It was about writing an argument, building an argument, and then presenting that argument to an audience, right? And then taking questions on your argument. So you were defending um, your rhetorical process and your argument throughout throughout that. Now we don't we don't we separate those two things, um, and so you have a, a oral communications class and then you have a composition class. But if you take if you take in those two classes, we teach pretty much the same stuff. And it's because we're we come from the same discipline, right? It's all about communication, right? Um, we just do things a little differently, right? So um, when you move into rhetoric, um, rhetoric is the process. Of recognizing and using the most effective strategies for influencing thought. Okay. So this is why we call people great statesmen, right? When we 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 hear people, um, if you if you've ever listened to Bill Clinton give a speech, or John F. Kennedy, or Martin Luther King Jr., 
or um, uh, Barack Obama, um, they are great speakers. They're great statesmen. Their, their concept and their understanding of rhetoric is impeccable. They know how to influence people's thoughts and emotions and whatnot. And then compare that to someone who's a poor speaker like uh, Donald Trump or uh, George W. Bush. Um, um, even Ronald Reagan was a, was a, was a great orator, but he, he was trained as an actor. So he was, he was good at, at kind of doing this process of rhetoric. Um, so, um, and if you go back and you listen to presidents from, you know, uh, uh up to a hundred years ago, you hear a much different cadence to the way they speak. You hear much more, uh, much more of these rhetorical processes that we're going to we're going to talk about here in a few minutes. You're going to you're going to hear much more of that in their speeches than we do today. Um, it's FDR and uh, and you know and the whole deal, the fireside chats and whatnot during the age of radio um, was that's where everybody was right during those times when those things aired. Everybody, their entire family would sit and listen to those those radio broadcasts. Um, so um, I, I don't think the same would happen today, right? Um, but when we look at um, when we look at how to use rhetoric, all right, we have to know what is happening. We have to ask why should someone speak out. Right. Um, we have to know who is present. Who's our audience? We have to say what are the audiences values and beliefs. Okay. This is important to look at um, because you don't, if you're trying to gather a larger audience, you don't want to alienate people, right? Um, I'm sure I alienate people left and right um, when I when I broadcast via Twitch. Some people see me and go, nope. Uh, other people see me and go, well, that looks intriguing, and they drop in, and then they hear something that we're talking about, and they may go, nope, or they may stick around, all right? It just it all just depends. It depends on whether the values and beliefs kind of merge with, with those of, of the community or not. So we have to we have to take those things in consideration when we're using rhetoric. We have to go, okay, so what are the what are the values and beliefs of our audience, right? Um, and then we have to ask what kind of language would best appeal to those beliefs. Okay, so this is the question that we're, we're, we're looking at, right, is what kind of language, right, is, is going to best appeal, right? So if you're appealing to a, a, an academic audience, you don't want to use slang. You don't want to use, uh, you don't want to use curse words or, or profanity, right? Um, if you're writing something that's to a, a less academic purpose, then you may want to use those things. It depends on who your audience is, who you're trying to reach, what's your purpose, Right, all of those questions need to be answered, um, and then you begin to to begin to use rhetoric because you're looking at strategies that most effectively influence the way people think and kind of their their engagement with your content. Right. Um, oops, I needed to go back. Let me do this. I just need to push that back. Queen Elizabeth does it well. <laughs> yes. Um, to gain proficiency in rhetoric, we have to answer some questions. We have to understand what is the relationship between language and thought okay what's the what's the what's the difference what's the relationship between them right are they the same 
our language and thought the same? Or, or are they separate from one another, right? Um, we have to understand that everything that we think sometimes doesn't need to be vocalized, right? Um, we have to learn to censor ourselves, right? Um, especially in certain company, in certain audiences, you don't want to say certain things because you'll begin to alienate them. Um, what's the difference between language and thought? Thought is kind of ephemeral, right? Thought is uh, can be conceptual, right? Whereas language has to be much more concrete. Um, we have to be clear. A, a thought can be ambiguous. We can have a thought that is not fully fledged, but if we're going to give it to language, if we're going to give language to it, we have to give it a, a complete kind of fleshing out. We have to, it has to be concrete and complete, and we have to think our way through it. So that's why writing is so important and drafting is so important, because we're working towards that process of thought to language and completeness, right? And making sure that we're explaining things in the way that, that the audience is going to relate to them most effectively. That's what rhetoric's all about. Okay, next one. A little tangy. How does a particular type of language influence oops, consciousness? It's going to ask me to be less wordy there. Nope, not going to do it. I'm just going to ignore you because I, it, the question says exactly what I needed to say. All right. So how does a particular type of language influence consciousness? Right. Does it make your does it make your reader stop and think about something else? Does it make them drift off of topic and think about something over here? Are they thinking about the thing that you asked them about? Does it make them pause and then come back, right? So that's what it means by just a particular type of language influence consciousness. We can ask questions in specific ways that make people react certain ways, right? Um, that's why tests are all, like every exam you've ever taken has an implicit bias to it because it's trying to affect you consciously so that you think in a specific way. Um, and that's what rhetoric tries to do is it tries to make sure that we think in a specific path. We want our audience to begin to think in specific in specific terms. So when people come to me and they say, well, you're trying to teach my kid how to be a fucking communist. And I go, I can't make your kid read three pages of a book. I certainly can't get them to read a communist manifesto, right? I, I'm, not here, I, I'm not here as a teacher to teach you what to think. I'm here to teach you how to think, right? Part of how to think is learning how to write effectively, right? And then, by virtue of that, you get to choose your own topic, right? You get to write your own paper, and you get to try to influence someone else's thought, and you take what you've learned how to think, and you get to try to make them think what you want them to think. That's what rhetoric is doing, right? It's moving, rhetoric moves us from the how to the what, okay? So, um, but we have to be much more specific when we do that, okay? The next one is how do specific values, beliefs, or mores um, get dismissed? Oh, no, 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 no. Right, mores stay in place. There we go. How do they stay in place over time, right? And then the next question is uh, the opposite of that question. How do specific values, beliefs, and mores uh, not stay, get dismissed over time? Good Lord. So there's two sides of the same question, right? Is is how do we, how do specific values, mores, or beliefs stay in place, right? Um, and how do others get dismissed, right? Um, we need to understand rhetoric because if we're, if we're trying to move people to a, to a way of thinking, 
we may have to, we may be moving them to a way, to, a way of thinking that replaces an older way of thinking that's a value belief or more, right? A more is, a, is kind of a morality um, or a moral paradigm that, that governs a, 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 a culture, right? Um, your family has mores, right? That you have your own morals, you have your own kind of things. Um, and society has theirs. Um, so how do we move? How do we change? How do we get those things to kind of adapt over time? We have to understand how those things occur for us to be able to effectively move people in a specific direction because people like to be frozen. They like to stay where they are. They don't like to think. They don't like to move. But we have to, as, as writers, as thinkers, as intellectuals, we have to be able to unfreeze people, move them, and then let them refreeze, right? And we have to know how far we can move them to let them refreeze. Because if you try to move them too far, uh, they, they throw that shit off, right? They go, they snap right back. They rubber band. They're like fucking mobs in a video game. They chase you for a little while and then they leash back, right? Because you, you tried to move them too far. It's the same shit with humans. That's the way thought works, right? Is we, we leash back to wherever it is that we, uh, we're, we're, we're kind of comfortable, right? So you can move people uncomfortable, you can make them uncomfortable for a little bit, move them in a specific direction, let them get comfortable there for a while and then move them again. This is why we have to work through our legislators and things like that to make piecemeal reform within our laws. Because if we try to change a law whole piece, right, whole cloth, right, people will reject it. It'll never get passed, right? But if we piecemeal it, we can get it done much more rapidly because then we're constantly just giving small changes, small changes, small changes. It's kind of like we, we treat people like lobsters or crabs in a fucking pot of water, right? If you put them, if you toss a crab or a lobster in boiling water, they fucking, they'll climb out of that pot, right? But if you put them in the water, put them on the stove and just turn the water, just let the water heat up gradually, they'll stay in there and they'll boil themselves to death and they'll never try to get out, right? Humans are kind of the same way. This is how they begin to take our, our, our rights from us, right? It's just a little bit of time like, well, so when you come to the airport, we're going to make you take your shoes off, right? Because we want you to be safe. How does taking my shoes off make me safe? I take my shoes off all the time at home and it doesn't make me any safer in my house because if a fire starts, I have to put my shoes on to fucking go back outside, right? You see, it, it, it counters logic, right? We're going to pat you down, right? We're going to violate your personal space. We're going to pat you down because we want you to be safe, right? Well, that's a violation of my, violation of my civil liberties, right? Now we're going to put you through a, a machine that actually looks underneath your clothes. No, no, you're not. By the way, you have the right to refuse that, right? You have the right to refuse that. That is not something they can make you do. Now, if you do that, they're going to try and harass you into going through that machine, but you don't have to do it. You have the right to refuse it. And then what they have to do is they have to bring two TSA agents here in the States, bring two TSA agents who are the same gender as you, and one of them pats you down while the other one observes, okay? That's how that has to happen, okay? That's their policy. So if everyone refuses to go through that machine, it becomes untenable for them to maintain the machines, right? And we keep we we create more positions for jobs, right? Because now they have to pat everybody down, and one person has to observe, right? Um, so that's one of the things that they do is they try to slowly move you to a place where you just go, ah, fuck it, just it doesn't matter, right? Um, it's at the point now where people don't know their rights anymore, right? Because they have just been told, do what you're told, do what you're told, do what you're told, right? Well, if a, if a police officer pulls you over and says, do you know why I stopped you, right? If you say yes, they don't have to tell you why they stopped you. You've just had an admission of guilt. So you just go, no, I don't know why you stopped me, right? And then they have to tell you, right? That's your right. They have to tell you why, that, why you've been detained, right? But people will just go, yeah, I know why you stopped me. Because right? they think it's going to get them out of a ticket. Well, if you're afraid of tickets, don't break the law. Don't speed. Don't run the red light. Don't whatever. Right? <laughs> and then you won't have to worry about it. Right? But I won't give up my rights to save me $100. I won't. That's just a principle for me. Right? So, that's a value. That's something that I hold dear. Right? So, that's what we've got to look at. Right? Is we have to know how those things get moved. Right? Um, a 
Okay. So that's um, that's how we gain proficiency in rhetoric, right? We need to understand the, the relationship between language and thought. We need to understand how language influences uh, uh, consciousness. And then how do our values, beliefs, and mores stay in place, and how do they get uh, dismissed over time, right? Um, and then we move into this thing called exigency, right? Exigency um, is an occasion when something happens oops, or doesn't happen that results in some uncertainty. So what we want it to do, right, when we look at exigency, right, what we're looking at is we're looking at things like lost car keys. We're looking at things like um, being left on red by someone, oops, good lord. Um, all right, so we have these type of things, right? So lost car keys, right? You don't know where your car keys are. There's some uncertainty there. You got it. So you start looking, right? Um, you start retracing your steps because you're trying to make, you're trying to logically recreate, um, where you left your keys, right? So once I, I I lost my car keys, my ex-wife was she was like, you know, I was looking in the cabinets, I was and she, I opened the freezer and I look in there and she goes, your keys aren't in the freezer and I just closed the freezer and I said, do you know where my keys are? Because that would just be fucking mean, right? If you know where my keys are and you're not telling me, that's just really mean, right? And she goes, well, no, I don't know where they are and I said, well, then don't presume to tell me where they're not. Right. I was retracing my steps when I came in the house. Right. And I went to the cabinet and got a glass and went to the freezer and got some ice. And so I was reached. Right. That's how we try to make sense of uncertainty as we try to make sense of it. If you've ever um, seen a car accident, you immediately try to postulate what happened, what went wrong. Right. Uh, if you've ever seen a, a, a semi truck flipped over on the side of the road. That's some shit that's not supposed to happen. Those are the biggest vehicles on the highways, and they're not supposed to turn over, right? That's So you start putting together what happened. Was it, Did the driver fall asleep? Was there a big wind gust? Did something run out in front of it? Somebody slam on their brakes? Was it right? Was a road? I, right? You start trying to put together the pieces of that puzzle that make it make sense for you, right? Because that's what our brain likes to do is it likes to make sense of puzzles, right? So this is the problem why if you if you've ever gone out somewhere, right, and your parents call your phone or they text you and you don't answer it or you ignore their text, it's why they start blowing your phone up. Because at the moment that you don't respond normally in your parents' brains, right, or if you're a parent talking to a child in your brain, your child is both alive and dead at the same time, right? It becomes Schrodinger's child, right? And you cannot, we cannot live with that, le that level of uncertainty. That level of exigency will drive us absolutely insane. So we have to resolve that exigence process, that, that problem. We have, to so we have to solve it. So that's why your parents start blowing your phone up, right? Or you start blowing your kid's phone up or your, your significant other or whomever. It's because in their brain, you're both alive and dead at the same time, and they have to solve that problem. That's what exigencies do to us, right? And that's why there's such a problem, right? That's why they have to be resolved, okay? So that's um, usually when we want, when we're trying to make an argument, where we're trying to make some type of Aristotelian argument, Tolmanian argument, Rogerian argument, or we're working from a position of rhetorical argument, 
what we're trying to do is we're trying to solve some exigence. We're trying to solve some problem that creates uh, uncertainty within our, our society, within ourselves, within our family constructs, within our, 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 our professions or what have you. That's what we're trying to do. So we're trying to solve those issues, right? Um, so if you look at the COVID-19 thing right now, the exigency that we're trying to solve by the stay-at-home orders and all of that is we're trying to make sure that we don't have more uncertainty about who's infected, who's not infected, and the spread of this thing, right? Can we get it again? People don't even, there's some studies that say we can get it again. There's some studies that say we can't, right? We don't know. We don't know. If you, just because you've had it once doesn't mean that you're safe. Your body, ha you have antibodies, but that doesn't mean that you have enough to stave off the, the infection again, right? Um, so, you know, we used to think that you couldn't get chicken pox twice, but you can. We just call it, um, what, what's it called now? Is it called hives? Is that what it is? I think that's what it is. So um, that's that's the, the the issue with exigencies. We're trying to solve a problem, and these are the means by which we do it. Okay. So the tenets of strong arguments, right? Shingles. Thank you. Thank you. I I, I, I get those two mixed up. Hives and shingles. I get screwed up all the time. Which one is hives? Is hives just an autonomic response, like anxiety induced, or is is it actually tied to another? Is it tied to another childhood disease or childhood illness? Shingles. Thank you, Amy. So, um, tenets of strong arguments, right? Um, as I wait for that. So, they should be revelatory rather than familiar. Okay? Highs is allergic reactions. Okay. That's, uh, thank you. Um, that's why I'm not a doctor right there. Uh, that's why I go. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take medical advice from this kid, right? Um, so, um, so strong arguments should be revelatory rather than familiar, right? That means they should teach us something. This is why I told all my students that you have to you have to develop an argument that you don't know the answer to, right? That way you have a strong argument that is relevatory rather than familiar. If you already know the answer to your research question, there's no point in writing that paper. It's a waste of time. Um, all you're doing is reinforcing. It's confirmation bias. It's not learning, right? Education and learning is supposed to be slow, painful, and relevatory, right? Um, they should appeal to logic rather than emotions they should focus on analysis rather than packaging What's the content? Let me back up. So we want to worry about the content, right? Um, um, not the container, right? If you put really shitty food in a really pretty container, it's still shitty food, right? Container doesn't make it taste any better. So the the goal within an argument is to focus on the content of that argument, not whether it's it's you know on pretty paper or it's you know it looks pretty or what have you. Um, it really needs to be uh, a solid argument. It needs to be based off analysis rather than packaging. We need to look at okay, so how do we analyze it? If somebody says something's a good movie and you ask them why and they start talking about the container of it all, right? The the like um, you can have a like you can have a movie that has lots of action and explosions and it's very it's very pornographic. It's very appealing appealing to the eye, right? Appealing. Um, but the dialogue is bad. Right, I'm looking at you, Michael Bay films. Right, um, those kind of things—they're fun to watch. Right, 
but they're all about packaging. There's really no substance to them whatsoever, right? Um, and then when he tried to do that, when he tried to make a movie that had substance to it, he just got fucking destroyed, right? Because people were like, that's not a Michael Bay film, you know? We don't go to a Michael Bay film to be lectured to. You're right. You absolutely don't. You go to watch shit ex explode, right? Because he does it amazingly, right? So that's that's what we have to look at is, um, you know, um, look at the, the, the package. Uh, don't look at the packaging. Um, and that's fine, but if you're gonna if you're gonna make an argument, right, you need to focus on on analysis, right? Um, how good are you at analyzing certain things, right? Find your strength, stick to it, right? And they should be inclusive rather than exclusive, right? The larger the audience. The better, okay. So that's what we've looked at. That's kind of the goal for today. I think I got through that in about a, right about time. So um, cool. So we've covered um, what is argument, what is an academic argument, right? Um, the problem with people and opinions, right? Um, we've gone through classical argument, Rogerian argument, Tolmanian argument. And the tenets of, of rhetoric and how to gain, how to use it, and how to gain proficiency in it, exigencies and why they're important, and uh, the tenets of, of strong arguments. What makes these arguments these arguments better than other arguments? Um, so that's argument in a nutshell, right? And um, so at this point in time, um, this lecture is done. Cool. So, if you guys have questions? Let me know. If you uh, if you don't have questions, um, I'm gonna take a few minute break and then come back because I gotta pee. Thank you for that email, Amy. I appreciate it. Yes, I need food as well. So. Cool. I'm going to switch screens real quick. So I got to work through some stuff. break for a few minutes and then I will be back hopefully you guys hang around if you do awesome if you got things to do and you got to run off I understand uh, I am um, let me see when we come back I think we're going to talk about the news for a while. I'm going to wait. Uh, I think I'm going to wait till Wednesday to do the lecture on uh, on Gulliver's Travels. Um, I think when we come back, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about uh, some stuff that's going on in the world, maybe. You guys feel like it if you don't feel like it fine fine sir fine so I should be back in a few minutes I'll see you in a bit enjoy the music
Point of jump. Yeah, I hear you, bro. There we go. So, we're going to take uh, a bit here and kind of catch up with what's going on in the world since that lecture's done. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do my lit lecture until Wednesday. Um, I only have two of those left to do, so actually one lecture and then the question and answer. But um, if you miss the uh, the lecture, if you're in my English 102 class and you missed the lecture for today, it will be rebroadcast at uh, 11 and 12 11 a.m. tomorrow and 12:30 p.m. tomorrow, um, and then at 11 on Wednesday. 11 and 12:30 on Thursday, because I have to apparently maintain a synchronous uh, class schedule, even though we've moved to online because people are stupid. And by people, I mean the people I work for and some of the people I work with. They don't understand how online how online is supposed to work. So anyway, um, let's see. Uh, top stories today. Um, according to Reuters, Trump made the. He said it's my decision when to reopen the U.S. economy. I bet it ain't. I bet it ain't. He didn't shut anything down. The governors did. Okay, the mayors, the county officials, and the governors of this country shut shit down. That motherfucker hasn't done shit, okay? Um, I'm sure he doesn't like it that everybody gets to sit around and just do nothing the way he's been doing for three and a half years, but... Um, there's an article from The Hill. Um, oh, nah, no, 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 no. What was that? About how reporters should, uh, should handle the briefings. So, uh... Oh, by the way, I'm 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 uh, I'm out of Twitter jail. Yay! Seven days of Twitter jail. I'm finally out. Um, so I'm back on Twitter again. They have warned me though that if uh, if I if I violate their rules again, they could completely shut my my account down. I lived almost fifty years without Twitter really not going to bother me. The only reason I have a Twitter account is for gaming. That's it, for streaming. It's the only reason I have one. But then I got involved in, you know, sharing political shit and then everybody got all mad at me. So, I don't really care. So, um, so this is about people uh, saying what they should do. Several media outlets, uh, while acknowledging the civic value of providing citizens with the president's perspective during a national crisis, several media outlets have recently expressed concern about carrying briefings live, unfiltered, without context or fact checks. The Washington Post, and New York Times, and CNBC stopped sending veteran correspondents. Uh, nowadays, declared Dean Baquet, uh, executive editor of the Times, the lengthy sessions make little news. 
Uh, CNN, MSNBC, ABC, NBC, and CBS have cut away from the briefing, citing a pattern of false and misleading information. A Seattle-based NPR station followed suit. Not surprisingly, perhaps, Rachel Maddow argued against broadcasting the sessions, not out of spite, but because they're going to cost lives. He says, uh, this, this author, who's this, uh, Glenn C. Altshuler, um, this is an opinion, uh, opinion piece. So, uh, he said, I suggest a somewhat different approach. Reputable media outlets should continue live broadcasts, reserving the right to return to regular programming. They should send reporters to the briefings following open remarks by President Trump and other officials on the podium, which alas is better suited to a reality TV show than social distancing. Reporters should direct all of their questions to the experts. Exchanges with these individuals are likely to be more effective in shedding light on how the coronavirus crisis has been, is being, and will be addressed. The experts are also likely to be more candid about inconsistencies on policies and messaging, and messaging inside the task force and disagreements between the White House and governors, and the questions put, them, put to them will be more useful than the seemingly partisan gotcha questions to a president who controls the microphone. Um, I, I don't disagree with that position, yeah. Right. That exactly, Joe. Exactly. Um, it's not. It's it's not something I'm worried about. To be honest with you, um, I, I don't really give a shit about Twitter. Um, He, 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 this guy makes a good point. Airtime and astounding ratings are Donald Trump's oxygen, his ventilator. They have helped him embed a post-truth political culture in the United States in which experience, expertise, and objective reality are trumped, per, pun intended, I'm sure, by alternative facts um, and appeals to emotion. Alternative facts in quotation marks. There are no alternative facts. There are, tr there are facts, and then there's bullshit. Um, that's what that is. Um, but they, that's what his administration calls their point of view is alternative facts. That's not how that works. That's not how any of that works. Right. Um, so if you want to know, the, the, alt, the uh, author, Glenn C. Altshuler, is the Thomas and Dorothy Litwin Professor of American Studies at Cornell University. So he's not just some guy throwing his opinion out there. He's, uh, he has a viewpoint that's kind of backed by by history. Um, so that's one article that's out there. Um, and then Trump's, you know, saying that he's going to, he's going to fire Dr. Fauci um, because he contradicted what he said, which is par for the course with this motherfucker. Uh, um, no. I, I don't want to talk about him. Um, so there's a, uh, um, from the New York Post and CNN, um, a sailor aboard the USS Theodore Roosevelt has died from the coronavirus. Um, that's the ship that was in question where they fired the captain uh, because he was trying to protect his people. Um, the coronavirus outbreak aboard the USS Theodore Roosevelt, which if you don't know is a fucking huge ass air aircraft carrier, um, whose captain was controversially fired for raising an alarm about the contagion, has claimed its first sailor's life, uh, the U.S. Navy said Monday. The unidentified sailor uh, had been admitted to the intensive care unit at the U.S. Naval Hospital in Guam last Thursday. On March 30, the sailor tested positive for COVID-19. He was removed from the ship and placed in an isolation house on Naval Base Guam with four other sailors from the Roosevelt. Since then, a dozen more have, t have tested positive. Um... That's that's all that story is, is just saying that this young man has died. Um, hopefully you guys weren't affected by the storms. I know a lot of people were. There's an article here from the Washington Post about the violent storms, tornadoes shift uh, to the East Coast. I'll link that real quick. Um, shift to the East Coast after leaving at least 21 dead and 1.3 million people without power. I know uh, 
Retired 8404 was in that group of people without power. I don't know if he has power back yet or not. I just know he posted some pictures of some broken power poles and whatnot around his property. So, um, so if you know anybody who's in that, um, check on your people, right? Um, the, 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 yeah, he's got a stub. Yeah, I saw that. He's got just like, he's got like a, I, I want to show you guys this picture. This fucking picture is unbelievable. That's a, that's a house in the middle of a highway. That's what that is. That's, yeah. You've never seen what a tornado could do. Uh, there's part of it right there. It lifted that house up and moved it and set it back down. Right? That's unbelievable. The, the force of so, uh, so that's apparently tenants, residents in states from Tennessee to Alabama were under stay-at-home orders when deadly tornadoes ripped through their communities. Um, I mean, it's this is from Monroe, Louisiana. So, not these. I'm sure somebody's gonna have. I'm sure somebody's gonna have to talk. I don't care about that ad. I hate ads, by the way. Chat. Uh, hate ads. That's why I don't have network television in my house. Uh, so. I ain't gonna go in there because I don't want to. I'm gonna have to give you a house and see what all we need. Though. Well, come on in. Come on in. Come on. Do you just. Okay. And Lord Jesus. If you ever go take video, chat, if you ever gonna take video um, of stuff like this, turn your, turn your phone sideways. Right? Turn your phone sideways. <laughs> Do it. I, I know that's probably not what he was thinking about at that moment in time, but. As the U.S. ramps up its response. Yeah, I don't need to watch that. Uh, let's watch this one. Probably going to give me some more ads, but yeah, I hate network TV, man. Yeah. I, I stopped watching network TV a long time ago. Um, I think right after the first season of Survivor is when I stopped watching network television because I was like, if this is it, I'm out. I'm out. This is what TV is going to. I'm out. Um, in parts of Mississippi and Louisiana, after yeah, more me, than a let me, I'm gonna rewind that. Destruction in parts of Mississippi and Louisiana after more than a dozen tornadoes left at least six people dead on Sunday and early Monday morning. The mayor of Monroe, Louisiana, assessed the damage. We've had major tornado damages here in the city of Monroe. And we're out assessing the different areas in our community. There's been major power lines that's down, major trees that's down. Also, uh, just a number of other structural damages here. At least three people were injured in Walker County, Georgia, where local TV reported a tornado completely destroyed a gas station near Old Highway 78. Paramedics pulled a woman from a damaged car at the scene. In Tennessee, first responders looked through the wreckage of homes outside Chattanooga. Tornadoes in Georgia dropped trees on homes in Cartersville, 40 minutes north of Atlanta. Six fatalities were recorded in Mississippi, the state's emergency management agency said on Twitter. Residents were under strict stay-at-home orders by the governors of Mississippi and Louisiana due to the nationwide coronavirus pandemic. Man, this is Lord Jesus. Yeah, because dealing with a fucking pandemic isn't enough for poor people. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. Uh, if the TV, your question is, how come there's no legit videos of corona patients that weren't produced by media or influencers? And how come the influencers' video is always post-infection? Uh, if, if, uh, if your question is related to a conspiracy theory, um, you can kind of go somewhere else with it. but. 
I don't I don't understand why you're the question you're asking and I, I don't uh, we don't we, we don't necessarily if it's post infection um, why would you film yourself before being infected why I don't why would you make a corona video the the question itself is is based in an illogical point um, you're not going to film yourself about an about a virus uh, or do a virus video if you don't have the virus it's always going to be after you get sick right uh, same reason you know we make videos about tornadoes after they hit houses because we can't make them before they hit houses so You tried to find a video. You heard no one getting sick nowhere. Um, I, I, um, I have a friend of mine who was tested positive for this. Um, Yeah, show me show me where you're getting your information, man. Because you know, conspiracy theories are all fun and whatnot, but I'm not dealing with that. So, if you have a source that you you like, you could send it to one of my moderators, um, and they will vet that source. Um, but um, you can whisper it to one of my mods. And it's a joke. But the the no, you can't you can't post links. My you have to send you have to PM it to one of my mods, and then they will they are, they are able to post it because. Um, so you can send it to Joe, or you can send it to uh, Librarian Wizard. But I have a friend of mine who was tested uh, who was tested positive. I had conversations with her, so this this is not made up shit. Um, you know, they're digging mass graves in New York City. Um, George Stephanopoulos has been diagnosed with coronavirus. Um, If you're getting the, that information, back, back to that. Most people can't get a first test right now because the, the government completely fucked this up. But, uh, So, according to the Boston Globe, this was 
I'm not going to read a fucking Bloomberg article because they're full of shit more often than not. Um, no medical test is 100% accurate. Um, they're saying the experts have suggested the number of false negative corona tests could be up to 30%, not 50%. The doctors in Massachusetts across the country are citing recent research that, that indicates the rate of false negatives that could be around 30%. The test detects virus particles in nasal sections from swabs inserted far back into the nose, the same type widely used in the United States. Uh, the data is limited, in, uh, and so there's no peer-reviewed analysis yet within the United States. That doesn't mean that it's not valid. It just means we haven't been able to do our own research because we're still on our fucking heels from this shit. Um, Um, we need to improve the test. Um, it's a truism in medicine. You need to look at the whole picture and not overweight one result. Um, yeah. Okay, Joe. It's a training video. Okay. So the testing may be falsely negative if the test is obtained too early or too late compared to infection or if the sample isn't obtained or processed correctly. Um, other doctors have said the long swabs inserted far up a patient's node could miss the virus if the patient is not showing many symptoms at the time of the test. Um, No test is 100%. So um, that's that's the reality of it. But when you're looking at uh, at this, if we've got uh, uh, there's nothing that shows us from Corona News Report. Okay. 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 Yeah. Um, so there's that. Um, false negatives and whatnot. They're about 30% according to that article. It's another article. Um, ProPublica and, and Bloomberg, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not reading them. Um, Looking through articles about it. I don't see it. Looks like it's from a report showing how ventilators work. Yeah. Seeing anything where it says it's fifty as high as fifty percent. They're saying that that was and that report was from eleven days ago. Um, so we'll see what the new tests are gonna are gonna be. They should have those out within this week. Everybody's developing new tests for this. So. Digging the Mandalorian, Joe. Good. 
It's good. I like it a lot. It's uh, it's good times. It's a it's a fun story. There's some dumb, dumb babies. So there's a California house party that uh, violated the stay at home order and drew around 400 people. Um, somebody drove by and uh, sprayed nearly 100 bullets into the house party and uh, injured six people. So. so. Absolutely, Joe. It's it's good to get away from the screens, man. That's I had to rearrange my entire office and change everything, move everything around on my desk just because my workspace was just driving me insane. I spend so much time right here, whether I'm grading or whether I'm streaming or whether I'm working on videos or whatever it is that I'm doing for work. Um, now that all my classes are online, I spend so much time sitting here. I was like, this shit's driving me. It's just too cluttered. And so I kind of moved everything back off my desk. I'll post some pictures of it. I, I got move mounts and whatnot and mounted my speakers and all that stuff. Stuff that I needed to be doing, I, I needed to do a long time ago. I finally got it all done. So so there's a much more habitable space for me. I don't feel so boxed in. And then uh, and I got my laptop working so I can work in my living room. Um, my desktop, I, I, I just realized there's a whole bunch of stuff on my desk that I didn't fucking need. Right? I just had stuff here. Right, and I just so I just got rid of everything that I don't need. Um, you know, I, I had a game controller here that I don't ever use. Um, I have an extra USB hub. I mounted it to the side of my desk. I mounted speakers to the to the back side of my desk. I have a, a center speaker, um, so I I just I punched I just drilled holes in those and fucking sank them in with wood screws and just you know got everything off my desktop and kind of mounted stuff around it so it's not cluttering up my desk. Did some cable management stuff and got all that stuff taken care of. So, um, so it's I'm much I'm much happier. It's um, I soundproof my windows um, so I don't have to listen to my neighbor's shit anymore. Um, so uh, I walked in here this morning and all the lights were out and it was pitch black in here and I was like, yes, that's what I wanted. I wanted it to just be absolute darkness in here, like a dark room. Um, and that's that's what it's what it's like now. So feels much more like a studio now than it did before. Yeah, so let's see what's going on locally around here. So apparently there's some Folks in Jackson County, where where I currently live, most of us here in Kansas City, where we live, uh, Jackson County won't release race data about coronavirus. Um, the Raytown chef who's giving away meals and raising money for hospitality workers and stuff. Um, we're under a freeze warning. If you guys didn't know that here in Kansas City. Um, that's crazy. From 9.42 a.m. today until 10 a.m. tomorrow. Um, uh, Hundred and thirty six new coronavirus cases identified on Easter Sunday here in Missouri. Former Missouri Governor Eric Greitens and his wife are getting a divorce. Well, can't imagine why.
So. So if you guys don't know, um, about two years ago, Eric Greitens, the former governor of Missouri, resigned um, because he was uh, accused of taking a compromising photo of a woman without her consent during a, 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 a extramarital affair in uh, 2015. Um, After much reflection, counsel, and prayer, we've made an amicable decision to end our marriage and move forward as co-parents who love our children. Okay. All right. Shit. So, send it to Joe. Um, uh, Here's a, a bit of good news in Kansas City. Sanctuary for Senior Dogs celebrates one year of operation. Shep's Place took in 22 dogs, adopting out 13 in their first year. Um, the, the home takes in older dogs. Many of you spend a lot of time stuck at animal shelters. Um, that's really cool. I didn't even know they existed. It's really cool. If you'd have told me this was how it would be one year later, it's fantastic. It's really worked out well. The home for old dogs turned one year old this week. Let's just let's watch that because that's fucking good shit right there. That's good news right there. I need good news in my life. You guys need good news in your life? I need good news. And what's better than fucking dogs, right? If you'd have told me this was how it would be one year later, it's fantastic. It's really worked out well. The home for old dogs turned one year old this week. The type of people who would help old dogs found us, and so we've really been able to, to find a lot of new homes for these dogs. Right now, the COVID-19, like everywhere else, has slowed the process. We had one of our volunteers that seemed to come down with symptoms. Fortunately, his test turned out negative, but that made us get real serious. So that means 10 of the 12 current residents are in foster care for a few weeks. Like everyone else, we're, we're looking forward to the time when we can bring all of our volunteers back and, and open our doors to some new dogs. Russell says in the first year here at Chef's Place, 22 dogs came through the door and 13 of those were adopted. Even dog number one, John Wayne. A popular pooch and staff favorite, the 10 year old had spent his entire right life on. in a shelter before coming here. I had a real hard time when John Wayne left, but still, you had to be happy for him. He adds, I'm looking forward to another year now that we know what we're doing <laughs> i think next year we'll be able to help uh, even more dogs than we did this year in independence alan shope can be c9 news very cool all right we do have to take it in context but part of taking it in context is not adding our own narrative to it um and and not so part of it right? is dealing with what we know and not what we what we wish or what we think or what our opinions are we have to work in in what's known because it's a training video. Yeah, 
Yeah. They actually exactly, librarian was you're exactly right. They have that what's called it's, it's called a HIPAA violation. Um, to show an actual patient is a, a patient is a without written express permission by that patient is a violation of federal law. Exactly. Exactly. You're exactly right. I mean, people on ventilators can't get permissions. They have a tube down their throat. So, it's <laughs> fake news. Um, yeah, it's you have to give permission. Um, filming somebody walking into a hospital is not a HIPAA violation. Filming somebody walking into a doctor's office is not a HIPAA violation. It's a HIPAA violation when you pass along medical information or medically implied information about a human being without their express written consent. Yeah, you're asking questions that can't be answered, Empathy. It's like ask, you, can't, you can't answer that question. Write the people who made the film and ask them why they didn't do it. Yeah, once you're on meds, you can't give permission because you're you're actually you're under the influence. It's not legally hold. It, it won't hold up legally. That's why you have to do your will and all that stuff before you actually go into the hospital. If you have a living will, you can't do it once they do that stuff. Widen your search. You're asking me. You're asking me questions that I can't answer. I can't answer why the internet's not giving you what you want. Yeah. We talked about this earlier about confirmation bias in the internet. So. Refusing to, to see what's being presented as being true because it doesn't align with your worldview is a specific kind of confirmation bias as well. It's the voter fraud, voter fraud question, right? No one can point to a specific to a specific instance of voter fraud anywhere, but people keep claiming it occurs. It's the, you're asking a question that, that I can't answer. Yeah. You know. Yeah, there's there it's it's affecting people different ways. Again, empathy, you're asking a question that no one can answer. It's 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 a non sequitur. It's it's a it's an absolute straw man argument. There's no there no one can answer what it is that you're asking. On the tech world today. Yeah. I 
I think the people who are sick, um, the people I've talked to that I know have, have been have tested positive for COVID-19, the last thing they're thinking about is making a goddamn video to post to the internet to satisfy somebody's curiosity. Exactly, zero. I don't need a video. Um, so, uh, ESRB says that game ratings will now include loot box warnings going forward. So, the new designation in it will say in-game purchases include random items will be assigned to video games that contain in-game offers to purchase digital goods or premiums with real world currency. So who do you want to make videos empathy if you if it's not and here's the thing if people don't have a platform if they don't have an audience if they're not influencers which is a term that's fucking ridiculous but anyway we'll use it right if, if they're not if they're in, if they're people who are the average person is not going to have a platform for that video who are they going to who they're going to broadcast it to their their friends it's not going to hit an algorithm it's not going to have enough hits it's not going to have enough clicks and likes and views for it to be recognized by an algorithm. So you're asking, again, you're asking a question that cannot be answered here. Yeah, thanks. I'm done addressing the same question over and over again. It cannot be answered here. I, I don't know the answer. Go ask the people who made the video, right? Go ask them, the people who made the video that you linked earlier, why they did what they did, right? The, you're, you're looking for confirmation of something that there's no confirmation for. It's, it's the God question again. You're trying to find something that probably doesn't exist because when people are sick, they don't make fucking videos, man, right? Last thing on my mind when I'm sick is talking. I don't even want to talk to another human being, right? Most people who have COVID-19 are having problems breathing. It's a little more important than making a goddamn video to satisfy someone's curiosity. That's the reality, right? So it, it, your question cannot be answered. Because you're not finding what you want, you keep asking me the same question over and over again. You're going to get the same answer. Right, you're looking for something that doesn't that, that that doesn't exist because people are trying to fucking survive. Right, let's if if you get it, make a video, man. <laughs> 